All right, welcome everybody. So today's discussion is going to be on lumbar spinal decompression surgery, techniques and tools, but kind of the easy way to remember is um, how do you do it? So what is it, lumbar decompression? What is it and how do you do it? And I just want you all to know that, um, just interrupt me anytime if you have any. Hey, Carlos Don. Hey, nice, just got started. So today's going to be on um, lumbar decompression surgery. Okay. Something that you've, how many do you think you've done in your lifetime? 10,000? A couple hundred thousand, yeah. A couple hundred thousand. <laughs> <laughs> a couple hundred thousand. And uh, back in, when you were practicing, you did the surgery with a flashlight, right? Flashlight and a pickaxe? No, we never start a fire. <laughs> they didn't even have heat. You'd have to start your own fire in the old days. <laughs> now it's easy, yeah. yeah. So a lot of patients ask me, like, how do you do it? And I thought I would go over it with you guys today. Um... Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Okay, so the, um, the basic premise for lumbar decompression surgery is this is a spine, and these are the nerves, and the nerves are compressed by something, uh, either a piece of cartilage or a piece of bone, and when the nerves are compressed, um, they cause a problem, uh, mostly pain, but sometimes weakness, numbness, and this is, um, um, I believe, Mixter from Mixter and Barr, the first uh, documented decompression in 1930-something. And he, he was, uh, they, they um, uh, wrote an article about, I think it was like 13 decompressions they did. So you want to decompress the spinal canal. This is the tube where the nerve run, nerves run, or the spinal canal. So something is compressing this tube, so you have to open it. Now this is um, verbeast. And his uh, was the first description of decompression for lumbar stenosis, that if you decompress the area which is stenotic, the patient's symptoms improve. So here's the spine, and you see the osteophytes pushing in, um, um, causing stenosis. So this is just a case, so you can sort of get an idea of what's going on. This man has stenosis, so here's the tube, here's the spinal cord, and the nerves are stenotic. You see how the tube from here to here is normal and big, but in these areas there's stenosis and it's giving the patient problems. Here's another view. And the stenosis is from a couple things. It's from the disc bulging backwards into the nerves and also on the back side of the nerves there's uh, increased bone and ligament structures from arthritis, um, ligament and flavum and, um, and bone. So just what I um, what I tell patients is they say, well, where where does bone come from? I show them my thumb, which is kind of knobby. You can see how my thumb is kind of knobby. Yeah, let me show on the video. It's kind of knobby there, and it's just uh, probably from old age, maybe injuries when I was a child or growing up playing sports, and the bone overgrew in my thumb, and it's somewhat knobby, and it's not hitting hurting my thumb, but in the spine, it's pushing in on the nerves. How how do you explain it, uh, Pete, to patients? Uh, I tell them if They've done heavy work over the years, teenagers and, and up. Um, mechanically, the stress on the spine can thicken bones. The bones will thicken, the joints will thicken, and if, if an athlete that Morning, contributes though. to it, anything like that contributes to it. Mm -hmm. uh, overweight can, and um, it's part of the arthritic process, but if, you, if, you're, if you're born with a nice big canal, you should be fine. Mm -hmm. But if you're born with a normal or small canal, then you're at high risk when this happens because then there's no breathing room for the nerves. Mm -hmm. And if someone's like having a tourniquet on one arm, nothing on the other arm, and I can use this arm all day long without stopping, and this one I've got to stop periodically because the tourniquet's on it. So mm -hmm. that's what I explain it to them. It's kind of simple just to make them understand what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this is a, a cut of the spinal canal. The spinal canal, again, we said is a tube and it should be a nice big tube like this. But you see how the spinal canal is very small here, uh, and it's due to the facets bigger, the bony area, and also this ligaments flavor, uh, ligament of flavum is hypertrophic. In other words, the bone is, the ligament's bigger here, and it's pushing in on the nerve. So here are the nerves normal, and here's a really small canal which has pressure due to these two influences, the bone here and the ligament. And this is, I showed the patient how I do the surgery how, how I was going to do the surgery. I just go on one side and then I decompress this side. 
I, I take away the ligament and flavum in that direction. Then I turn the table. I'm going to show you how to do that, how I do that. And then I decompress this side from the opposite side of the table. So in this way, the posterior spinous process stays intact. The lamina on this side stays intact. And the musculature all stays completely intact here. So, and I'm going to show you how I do this. So this is uh, usually spinal surgery in the lumbar spines in the lower area. I'd say, what do you think? L4 to S1 is, what do you think, Be like 80%? 80-90%. And you may say, well, why is that? I have my own theory. It's because most spines are not upright. Most spines, um, however they're designed by God or whatever, are to walk on all fours. So we're the only animal really that is constantly on, on two, on two uh, legs because we have to use our hands to do spine surgery or knee surgery, etc. So because of that, we've developed a tremendous amount of lordosis in our two lumbar areas. And I think that's why L4 to S1 develops a lot of arthritis as we get older. That's my personal theory. No, I agree with you. And again, what happens when you've got something mechanical like this, when you do routine activity and you do it where you're bending and twisting and straining, you're putting a lot of stress not on the upper part of the lumbar spine, all the weight is on the lower part. And the two lower discs, they've got 90% of the weight and 90% of the effort and stress that you're carrying out as you're pulling, tugging, lifting, and, and straining. It's the base. It's also the base. It's the yeah, base of the column. It's the base of the column. So mm -hmm. the, all, all the weight is there. And um, it's, they go very rare that L1, 2, L2, 3 gets into trouble. It's usually 3, 4, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. 4, 5, 5 is what gets mm -hmm. into trouble. So let's say if we could do a magical cut through here, to s through someone's body. So we just did a magical cut through someone's body at L5. Uh, so we call this a transverse section. And this is where the patient's buttocks would be down here. And this is where the belly button or umbilicus would be here. And we, this is a spinal canal. So you want to get there to open that up. So how do you get there? You can't go through the side because the pelvis is in the way. You can't go through the belly because all the intestines are in the way and it would be a really deep hole. So the easiest way is to go through the backside. And it's not that deep usually. This patient just happened to have, happens to have very robust lumbar musculature, wouldn't you say, Christina? Yeah. Yeah. So this this patient's obviously dead. Person, human being's dead because it's a it's a cadaver cadaveric study, but very robust uh, musculature. So you go through. So what I was saying is, when you go through these muscles and spread them apart, the muscles can die. So you want to minimize that. And the way I minimize that is just going on one side and moving the retractor around. So at any point in time, there's not that much pressure on the nerves. So again, one more thing is, this is the posterior spinous process. This is the posterior extensor musculature. You want to get to the spinal canal. So you have to remove some bone, some lamina. This is the bony part lamina. And some ligament and flavum, which is the uh, ligament that attaches to the two bones. You don't want to disrupt this thing, which is the facet, which is where the two bones are coming together. So you, you have to remove some of it because usually the, there's pressure on the nerves, but you want to remain the integrity. The other important anatomical structure is the um, uh, dorsal, um, uh, the dorsal fascia of the lumbar spine, which is gives us extension. So the extension in the lower lumbar area is very important. So. If you keep the posterior spinous processes intact, this is my theory, and you attach the lumbar dorsa back to the posterior spinous processes, I think you maximize the chances of patients having a strong back. So what do you think of that, Pete, that theory? No, I, I think you're probably right, but we didn't, I didn't do it. In my time, we were trained to just go straight through it and divide both sides. Divide both sides and, and take, the, both sides. take the lamina off. Mm -hmm. But see, things that the microscope's gotten better, yeah, the absolutely. techniques, yeah. I agree with you. yeah so, so this is the standard thing that uh, Pete was describing is both sides are cut in the spinal canal, the whole thing's lifted off, and now the tube is open and the nerves are good. Decompression. The standard decompression. So this is a standard decompression of laminectomy, take off both lamina, cut it on both sides, lift the whole thing off, and then the nerves are free. Now, the te technique is somewhat involved, not evolved, not for everybody, but some people. This is the porthole technique. This is my former partner, Charles Edwards, and one of his fellows, and he described this technique of just drilling basically bilateral laminotomies, which you did right too, right, Pete? You sure, did? Yeah. yeah. And leaving the posterior spinous processes intact and just decompressing the area which is stenotic, which is at the level of the facets and the level of the disc, leaving the posterior spinous processes intact. So 
is called the porthole technique. And that's sort of evolved as the microscopes have gotten better to this is the uh, laminectomy technique, this is the porthole technique, but this is the unilateral laminectomy, bilateral decompression. So you do a unilateral laminectomy, tilt the table, and then undercut the posterior spinous process, undercut the opposite side, and then open the whole spinal canal from just this one approach. So this is the pre-op uh, stenosis. This is in the post-op. You can see how you can cut it. Uh, and it's been, it's been described, first described uh, in 95 in neurosurgery, but there's, it's been described multiple times now, unilateral laminectomy, bilateral decompression, and it does well. So this is the thecal sac. So here's the cut. The cut in the skin, these are muscles, this is a cadaver, dead person. And this is what the thecal sac should look like. It's a, like a balloon full of fluid. And the nerves are inside the balloon with fluid. And the, the, things, the things that you have to remove are some, so the way the surgery's done, and I'm gonna show it to you, is you take some of this lamina off, you remove some of this facet here, and you take this ligament and flavum away. So the ligament and flavum is the yellow ligament. And you can see the yellow ligament here in the spinal canal. This is after you remove the bone. You have to remove the yellow ligament, and that exposes the nerves. Uh, and you want to retain the facet uh, alignment. So, Pete, how did you do your decompressions? Prone, knee, chest, face down. lateral? Face down. Face down. Prone? Face down, yeah. Wilson frame? Yeah. So, some people, this was popular for a while, the knee, chest position and the Andrews frame. But it was very cumbersome, and you can imagine <laughs> Getting the patient on this position was hard, and um, moving him was hard. If there's an emergency, it's very difficult to get the patient off the table. Also, this this uh, this position did have complications of um, of uh, injuries to the extremities, neurological injuries, and you can get a compartment syndrome of the legs. The benefit is it opens up your spinal canal because you're flexed. So it, it gives you better access to the spinal canal. But I think now most people just do the prone position, which is on your belly. And there, there are multiple tables that you can use. You can use a standard OR table, operating room table. Now, I think in the last 20 years or so, the Jackson table is very popular. And this is the first generation Jackson table for the prone position. You see this big hole here for the belly? So that lets the belly free. And I remember the first time I used this was in, 19, is in 1999, I had to do a disc on a pregnant woman, and I was terrified. And the pregnant woman said, either you take the disc out, or I'm going to kill this baby, because I, I just can't deal with it anymore. She's like eight months pregnant. So I didn't know what to do, so I used the Jackson table, because I knew that the belly could be, would be free here, and during the operation, there was a nurse with the ultrasound checking the fetal heart rate. It was very um, stressful surgery, and she did great. But that's the first time. But then I, th I was thinking, hmm, maybe I should use this for all the surgeries because a lot of my patients have large abdomens. Um, now, during the surgery, we have to know where we are. And this is the um, C-arm that we have at the hospital. Actually, we don't have a 9900. We have a 9800, but it's very similar. Um, and it's an x-ray machine. And this is where the beam comes out. And this is what receives the beam. And it's like the shape of a C, and it goes around the operating room table. And we're, I'm going to show you how it works. And then we have a screen here, and this shows this shows us what level we're at. So wrong, we have to be at the right level, and the spine has many levels. What did you use, Pete? Did you use X-rays or C arm? This is this was back many many years. You just put a plain X -ray, film, X-ray, film, and get the X-ray. And you got to wait for the film. Yeah. Yeah. So these, these have gotten really good now. And I did them on the side so that I would just shoot right through it and, yeah. and see exactly where I am. Yeah. And you have to do that. I mean, you have to do that. Yeah, you have to know where you are. Yeah, and then you once you get down to where you are, the microscope is tremendous now. It is so good. So here's where you operate. It also has a high-definition screen for the nurses and the OR so they know what you're doing. And you put this over, drape this over the patient, and you perform the operation with... Uh, your 10 times magnification, it goes up to like 12. And it's, you'll see, it's very, very powerful. And this is what it looks like when you're using it. Um, this, this is probably the surgeon, this is the assistant. Uh, and uh, they're looking at each other so they can talk to each other and then the beam goes down. It's kind of like um, a submarine. And the, the beam is very powerful too. It's a very powerful fiber optic light. So you don't have to use the operating room lights. And you can make very small holes because the light's so powerful. Okay, so I want to show you positioning. 
Does anybody have any questions about surgery? Sorry that took so long, but I think I had to explain that first. So just give me a second, guys. So I'm going to show you how we position the patient. So this is this is our operating room. Yes, like two days ago, and that's me, <laughs> and I'm getting on the table. That's this is our new table. It's the Jackson Two table, and you see it can bend here. You see how it's bent? So it kind of does give a knee chest position. I can do a lot more than that. And the patient's in the prone position. I'm the patient. That's uh, our scrub tech. Here's our microscope, and you see I'm I'm. I'm changing the position. I'm going to show you how we do this. I'm, I'm rotating. You see how you can easily rotate the patient? And they have these, uh, these things that hold the chest in position. And you can rotate the, the patient a lot so that you can do what I said. Remember I said you rotate the, the uh, microscope and the spinal canal to decompress both sides. And this, this table really holds the patients well. In the middle, there's a hole for the belly. And you can even flex this even more. You can flex it up to like 40 degrees. I usually don't do that because it's not necessary. And now, so this is just showing you the rotation. And then I'm going to show you the, uh, you can also very easily do um, uh, Trendelenburg position and uh, reverse Trendelenburg. Usually I do reverse Trendelenburg and I have the head higher than the heart and the legs so that the face doesn't swell. So that's like a serious problem in spinal surgery, uh, facial swelling. And see how I'm, the head's going up here? So usually I, I kind of have it as high as I can that's comfortable. But it's hard because of the angle of the microscope, uh, it's hard to do the surgery if they're, usually it's about half that much. And then sometimes we do Trendelenburg, so we put the head lower. Uh, the problem with Trendelenburg is that it puts a lot of pressure on the face and eyes. And I can tell you for me, I mean, I'm, I'm like 46 years old and I'm, I'm a healthy man, that was bothering my face. When I was in Trendelenburg, I could feel like pressure on my face like I was hanging upside down. So that's why I, I do things like this because I want to feel what's going on. So now, I had the pillow under me. Under your face? I think so, yeah. No, actually I didn't. But still I could feel like pressure. Like you know when you're a child and you hang upside down in gymnastics, you feel the pressure? So this is the, now this is during the operating room. Here's our C-arm and we cover it with plastic because uh, everything has to be sterile. And the patient's um, covered with all the drapes, sterile. And this is the first thing, I put two little needles in the spine and I plan my skin incision. So I basically guess, and you can see I have all the x-rays and the MRI scans up here so I can, just before the operation, I confirm where I have to be and I get everything ready in my mind's eye, what do I have to do? And this is the x-ray tech and she's gonna shoot the x-ray. So I always do a lateral view just because I think it's the most um, uh, specific way to understand where you are because the sacrum is very easy to see. And um, so she's uh, getting the C-arm ready and it takes about five, takes about five or ten minutes pre-op. Um, the X-ray comes from the small part, and then it's caught by this big part. So this is a good tech. She knows to go all the way up next to the patient. It gives you the best uh, picture. We also have um, we're connected to the computer system in an OR, but I prefer to have the I prefer to have the films because I can't I can't manipulate the computer while I'm scrubbed. I mean I have several gloves on, so I don't know what other surgeons do, how they just deal with uh, CDs. This is the Midas Rex machine. So there's a new Midas Rex machine that's all electric. I'm going to show it to you. And uh, she's just looking at me. She's saying, no. actually, she was asking you, like, do you want to move? Aaron was taping this. See, we never used any of that. We didn't have it. I mean, we didn't you didn't have a good machine. Like, the machine. You made an incision, you, you decompress the body, take the muscles away, and then you, you stick your instrument in yeah. where you want. So there's the screen. So this shows you the microscope, how agile it is. It's, that's me. You're bringing it in and see how see how easy it moves. It goes right over the patient. It's all it's some plastic. That's it. So that kind of shows. So any questions about the positioning? Okay. All right. So let's go through the tools. Like what are the tools that you use? Okay. So we'll start with the basics. First is the scalpel. I still use it. Yeah, everybody still uses scalpel. Same as yours, right? This is probably a hundred-year-old scalpel. <laughs> You had to use the garden tool. And then Bovi. So Bovi, I do most of my approach with the Bovi because it, it um, it's, uh, hold on. And the way the Bovi works, it, you, you pad the patient and then the electrical current goes through the body and it kind of burns and cuts at the same time. Now some people use tubes for the decompression. I think the first tube that came out was Metrix from Medtronic. I, I tried the tubes, but 
I felt like the Taylor retractor is just easier. It's just faster. I don't have to deal with anything. I can adjust it in two seconds. I'll show you how easy the Taylor. Did you use the Taylor? No, but we use retractors. Sim kind of similar. As as this, but similar yeah, similar. And this is a this is a suction tube that I like to use because it's plastic. It's soft. It, it's uh, malleable, and I can push nerves around very easily with the plastic tube. I don't always use it, but I commonly use it. You can always use a Fraser tip, which is metal. Um, it's a, it's a little it's stiff. So you, you can injure the dura with this or the covering of the nerves. Um, and, but you can also change the pressure of the suction by putting your finger on the hole. Now this is what we use for suction now. You didn't have this. This is called the Neptune. It's a totally independent uh, system. And it's not wall suction. Have you used the Neptune, uh, Doug? What are your thoughts of the uh, Neptune? Hate it? Love it? Uh, it's okay. The good, the good news is that the wall suction doesn't work sometimes. And um, then you don't have suction, it's a big problem. So I found the Neptune is a lot more um, uh, efficient in the operating room. Of course, it costs a lot of money, but it's made by, I think it's made by Stryker. Now, what's this guy doing? This guy's chiseling out a bone to create art. Now, in my mind's eye, that's what I do in the spine. I have to chisel this bone away from the nerves. And in my mind's eyes, I know what I wanna do. And, and that's the same as a sculptor. I have to remove all this bone and, and know, what it, know what I need to end up with. And, but you have to be very careful because you're trying to chisel something out that's extremely sensitive. So you can imagine if you put a piece of spaghetti in there and you tell the sculptor, okay, cut all the bone away until you get to the piece of spaghetti. But don't cut the piece of spaghetti or the patient's foot won't move. So it's, it's a difficult thing to, to do. So this is um, a burr that they use like to fix a Corvette. And this thing rotates very quickly and, and drills out a hole. So we use the same instrument. Here's different burr types. Now, f for, for like four or five years, I was using the Onspock. This is exactly what I was using. It's, this is the burr. It looks like an acorn. In the last couple of years, I switched to the Medtronic Midas Rex. It's the same, similar burr, but I think it's better. I'll show you. The, the Onspock was an air-powered or pneumatic uh, drill. But do you use a pneumatic drill still, Doug? What I don't like about it is that it can kick sometimes. So if the core, the 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 um, so if you, if you uh, the whole thing can get out, jump out of your hands. So you don't want that near your nerves. And then the other thing is this hose can explode. I've had two of them explode on me. Yeah, the nurse pulls it apart when under pressure, and it, you know, blows the <laughs> instrument across the room and missed my head. Box. Yeah, it's it's a little bit dangerous. Um, and also you have to deal with the air pressure. Uh, there's a big tank with air pressure. Now, in the last three or four years, they have an electric burr now, uh, and that's it. There's no, there's no hoses, there's no, there's no tanks. It's just an electrical unit. It's a lot, I, my opinion, I, I, don't, I'm, I don't own any Medtronic stock, and I'm not paid by the company. This is a lot easier, and it's a lot safer, because you don't have the kick anymore, because you don't deal with the air. The hose doesn't explode. You still obviously have to be careful, because it's a high-speed burr. It goes about 60,000 revolutions per minute and you have a pedal that you use for your foot. So this is, um, this is what we remove the bone with a kerosene punch. So this is the working end, you put your hand there, and the working end, you, you slip this underneath the lamina, and this part eats up, and I'll show you how it works, it eats up the bone away from the nerves, and this part is super smooth, so that it's up against nerves. Do you know who, Pete, do you know who invented the kerosene? I can't find it. No, but in the old days, that's all we had. I mean, Kerosene's, that's it. You Did you have about. burrs? Yeah, we did, but not archaic burrs. Archaic yeah, burrs, yeah. yeah. Prim primitive. Okay. Primitive big ones. This is the whole procedure. The whole case was with a Lexel and a Kerosene, <laughs> yeah. right? So also Penfield. Penfield um, just mentioned him because he went to Hopkins Med School, and um, he did. Uh, he set up the Montreal Neurosurgical Institute, and he graduated from Hopkins Med School, I think, in 1906 or something. And uh, he's. Um, would you say he's like a pioneer in neurosurgery Absolutely. in the world? So we still call the instruments after Penfield. So this is a Penfield, um, I, think it's a, I think it's a two. It's very smooth and you can feel nerves with it. This is a Penfield one. It's again, a very smooth cup so that it doesn't injure the nerves and you can remove bone material with it. Um, I think this is a two, this is a four. You can see how smooth it is. I also use a lot of curettes. So the curettes are very smooth. They come in different sizes and you can remove bone and ligament from the curettes. And they can be sharp. They can be straight or curved. And uh, a patute ronzure, which is, uh, which was initially developed to remove adenomas in the brain, 
through the um, uh, transsphenoid, uh, um, right, Pete? Did you yeah. do? Did you use this this approach? Well, I, yeah, I did all, all the time, mm -hmm. but not for the spine. Mm -hmm. I never used it for the spine. Mm -hmm. Uh, but th that this was designed to do this to go in someone's exactly. nose and remove an adenoma. Okay, so surgical video show you to find. Okay, so any questions about the instruments? Okay, let's look at the instruments. So this is these are the instruments that we use. Go to. So here's the burr under the use of, under the microscope, and this kind of this also gives you an idea how powerful the microscope. That burr is um, three millimeters in diameter, and um, look how look how powerful and beautiful the microscope is. It's incredible, and it shows you the flutes. It's very smooth here, so that if it hits the dura, it probably won't tear the dura. Uh, and it cuts mostly on the outside. I'm going to show you the flutes uh, on the burr. I'm going to roll it. So it's kind of different than what I used to use in orthopedics where the whole burr was um, serrated. See the flute right there? So it's, it's, um, it's actually a very delicate instrument. Uh, and it works really well on the spine. This is the AMA burr. And I think most people use that burr head. You can always also use diamond. So here's a kerosene punch. Again, this is the working end, and it's very smooth. And this thing comes down, and it and it grab it basically grabs things. So if you put uh, Aaron's doing this, so she's going to punch it. You see, how I can grab the bone, and then the bone sticks inside here in the mouth, and you remove it. See how the mouth has a little cup in there? That's basically the same instrument you've used, right? It's yeah, always been the same. Okay, the next instrument is the um, is the curved curette which is very smooth on the outside uh, and it removes bone and ligament. And then the pen field we talked about is a very smooth probe that you can you mostly feel with, but you can also dissect with uh, the pen field. And I use a ball tip probe that's smooth that you can feel uh, bone contours. And uh, I also use the Woodson, which is a curved hockey stick. And that's a pen field uh, uh, one, I believe. And I use wax for bone bleeding. See, that? this is a Penfield 4 and there's wax on the end of it. This we call the mother-in-law. It's a very powerful, strong, aggressive uh, kerosene. Why do you call that the mother-in-law? Well, <laughs> if you had a mother-in-law, you'll know. And that's... <laughs> that, and there's another and that, instrument that's called mother-in-law. There's another one? What's the other one? Yeah, the, the retractor, you have two... <laughs> you stole that? The hip surgeons have a mother-in-law too? It's, they're usually very powerful, dangerous instruments. You have to be very careful with the mother-in-law. So this is, this is the Taylor retractor. And uh, you can see how I can move it back and forth. And I open it up. And I let it go a lot. So if I'm not using it, like just then I wasn't using it, I had it relaxed so there's no tension on the muscle. And then when I want to see, I pull it down and I have it connected to a um, cling on my foot and it opens up the area for the nerves. And I just move the Taylor retractor around. And I, I use a suture for retraction on the other side. And okay, so any, any questions about the, um, about the instruments? So let's, um, let's go into the surgery. How are we doing on time? So just this will give you an idea of um, of the surgery. So the first step is uh, with electric cautery. So you see the tailor is doing the retraction, and I'm on oh, this is so this is the head of the patients over here on the left, the foot of the patients here on the right. This is the midline. This bone is the posterior spinous process. So we're only exposing the left side of the spine in this case, and usually I pick the more symptomatic side. Uh, and I'm basically, I have to expose the uh, lamina um, um, and um, I, get, I find the uh, medial border of the facet area. And you can see I, I'm like extending the incision. I'm kind of like creating a hole to see through. And I'm really obsessive about bleeding because I feel if, if there's any bleeding, it's going to, if there's any bleeding before I get started with the nerve work, it's going to increase the operative time because you can't see if there's blood in the way. So I, I try to make sure I have a bloodless feel when I start. 
So I do the whole. That's why I do the whole thing with the electric car. You see, I'm moving around the tailor. So I think it's beneficial to move the tailor around. It's probably even better than the tube because at no, you don't always have static pressure all the time on the nerves. You're constantly moving this thing around, and it's easy to move around. Uh, and, and since there's not that much pressure on the muscles, then there's a lower probability that the muscles will die. So, so this is the lamina, and I'm just exposing the lamina on um, uh, where I'm going to do the surgery. So any questions about that? So, so the next, so I have to expose it. This took about 10 minutes. This was a two-level decompression. And then once you expose all the lamina, you bring the burr out. That's a mother-in-law. See, it's a very aggressive instrument. You got to be very careful. Very aggressive, very powerful. And I use that if I need to do, um, take out a lot of soft tissue away. So the next, so I basically I exposed everything that I need. I'm just removing some more, um, this is mostly ligament and flavum. So the, then um, the burr is gonna come out. I'm just, uh, um, again, make sure it's a dry field uh, everywhere where I need to be. So this is the lamina here, and this is the, this is the, where the two lamina meet, where the ligament and flavum is, and that's sort of like the window to get started to find the nerves. So this is this is the lamina above and the lamina below is right here and this is the ligament and flavum which is extremely hypertrophic in this patient. You see I'm adjusting the microscope, how easy the microscope is to adjust. It used to be like the microscope would be really hard to adjust, uh, but now it's so simple. It's like it's like driving a Mercedes. I don't I don't own a Mercedes. I'm, I mean, uh, but I know Doug does so he'll understand. So it's it's like driving a Mercedes, very comfortable, very <laughs> Okay, so here's the burr. It's a high-speed burr, and you. So the burr is used to thin the bone away, to to get a very to go towards the nerves. So I know what I where I have to burr. So when I first got started, it, I, I was very slow, but now I now I know what it's supposed to look like, and I know how fast I can go. And it's just like driving a car. You, I can drive from here to Baltimore City and have a total a conversation at the same time. And, uh, and I don't even pay attention where I'm going. So I think over the years, your brain works without you knowing it. And you do most of the operation under autopilot, so to speak. So that's why, even though it looks a little erratic and fast, as a surgeon, don't you think, Doug, is like a lot of what you do is on autopilot. You've done it so many times before that you, you go very quickly and you're not even thinking. It's like your subconscious, sort of, you know, sort of. One of the famous Hopkins surgeons said, the operating room is a terrible place to think. <laughs> Well, you should not be. Yeah, you should. Every you should. We should. Do, we should think another way. Is like when in the operating room, you're just you're just taking care of a plan that you thought of before you got there. So you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be making things up. Or you should you should already have thought the whole process through, and then it's just a technical thing. Just get it done, and, and then you're basically on autopilot. So I'm using a kerosene here, and this this has been thinned down. So the kerosene, this is a kerosene punch, and that's a suction, and I'm just removing a soft tissue from that. So the burr, you can see the burr is used to remove bone, but also I feel with it. See how I'm feeling? So I'm burring lamina, and then I'm feeling with it. And when I feel, I, it stopped. See how it stopped? So I burr, I stop, and feel. So I burr, remove bone, stop, and feel. I'm sorry, what do you fear for? You fear for the, if it's, if it's soft. If it's soft. Right? right. If it's soft, don't go there. So, because that's ligament of flavum, and I so what I do is I remove all the bone with the burr. Now the ligament of flavum is deep to the bone, and it protects the dura, because it's ligament of flavum is a stout structure. So I don't take off the ligament of flavum until I've removed most of the bone. And so it's kind of like a it helps. You can do it quickly because you don't have to worry about injuring the nerves. But you also have to be very careful because you can't feel with the burr on, because you'll you know you could rip apart a nerve. So I, I've never had a problem. I think it's because I used to play the organ, and I'm very used to using my feet and my hands at the same time. But I think all, all people who do spine surgery, they get very used to doing this sort of thing. So you're constantly on and off with your foot. So you burr and then feel. You may see how, how thick it is. Burr, and then you're constantly feeling to see if you're getting close uh, to removing it. And then the small curve curette is used mostly, again, to feel how, how thick it is. So let me... Um, so it's, it's just a constant process. So you burr bo the bone down and then you feel. So you burr down and then you feel, see that? So it's, it's, just, it's just constant back, forth, but Aaron, do you have any questions or? So you're basically thinning everything down until you get down the ligament of flavum. So just give me a second here, where are we? 
So next is Tourette. The canal is 29. So now this is the this is entrance into the spinal canal. So that's removing the ligament of flavum. So this big thing is the ligament, the yellow ligament. And this patient was very, very big. And and I'm removing it from the spinal canal. And the nerves are right here. They're covered with fat. You can't really see them. So this ligament of flavum is so uh, big and hypertrophic and stout that I'm removing it with the kerosene just to decompress it because it's I, it's even too big for the kerosene. So I'm removing the ligament of flavum at this point to thin it down. So it's a constant process of thinning it down. You see how the kerosene removes the bone? The mouth part gets underneath the, uh, the uh, bone and it's soft on the uh, outside part and then it eats, it basically eats the bone away and pulls it away. So it's a constant pulling material away from the nerves. You don't want to push towards the nerves because then the nerves could be injured. So this is uh, the Woodson, so I'm, I'm constantly feeling, so I'm feeling, so here's where the nerves are, and I'm in the spinal canal there, but there's still some ligament of flavum. See this ligament of flavum that's still there? So that, I have to take that off. So I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling with the um, Woodson, and then I'm removing it with the kerosene. So you see how it's, the, see how the kerosene punch is smooth, and it removes the ligament of flavum off the nerves, and the nerves are right here. You can't really see the nerves, though, they're as white, there's still fat covering it, and as, as long as there's fat there, I just leave it because it's one more added protection to the dura so I don't get a spinal fluid leak. So it's a constant process of um, feeling and removing, feeling and removing, feeling and removing. So now I've tilted, I've tilted the microscope and the table and I've undermined the posterior spinous process and then now I'm going in this direction. So I've done the left side and now I'm going to open up the right side. See that? So I'm opening up the opposite side now. So before I, before I remove anything, I have to make sure the dura is not scarred down to the um, posterior elements, and I do that with a Woodson to make sure it's free. And then I burr, I burr this side, and I protect the, protect the dura with the uh, suction, and I remove the right side. <coughs> so, so any questions about, so I'm removing it. I use the same, same process now, the opposite side. So you just thin everything down, and uh, the same thing, but you're undermining everything in this direction. And I usually use a suction to protect the dura. So any questions? So it's kind of, I think that kind of explains everything. Let me see a final result. This is like final touches. So this was a two level decompression. And I do a hemilaminectomy so the tube's open. So let me show you what it looks like at the end. At the end of the procedure. Okay, so this is this is at the very end. I put some music so it's soothing. And so you can see the thecal sac has been totally opened. Um, and it, it, I performed hemilaminectomies the whole up. Uh, this is a four-level decompression the whole way up and down. And now these are the final touches. And this white stuff is the nerves or the thecal sac. And the, and basically the tube has been reconstructed. It's the big circle now. And by performing hemilaminectomies, they're all connected. It's very easy to make the tube a very nice, big, open structure all the way up and down. This is an L2 to S1 decompression. And I only opened up one side of the spinal canal. So that's basically it. So any, uh, any questions about how to decompress the spine? All right, that's it. So, um, any questions about anything? We all good? No, it's a nice case. Bro. Everybody, yeah. What would you say that, you know, nothing is ever 100% that you are symptom free or whatever, but what would you say? I mean, I think patients do well after this surgery. Would you say it's a, you know, one of your things that's like, yeah, this is usually 90% successful in people or? Uh, it's a very broad. Um, it's a very broad question. It's yes. kind of like, is there good in the world? Well, 
So I think there is good in the world. And also I think people do well with surgery, right. usually. Right. Is that a good enough answer? Yeah. Um, but you have to pick your people right. Right. You have to do things that you think will work. Right. Um, not, not everybody is, is a surgical treatment. And not everybody, people have many confounding factors that lead to a poor post-operative outcome. And those factors in human, I mean, human beings are not perfect people. So those factors quite often are depression, anxiety, other medical conditions that can cause the same type of symptoms like diabetic neuropathy, uh, inflammatory conditions like ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis. Those conditions, you know, can still give you back and leg pain and yet not be from uh, spinal stenosis. So usually though, if you pick your patients well, patients do well. Aaron, what do you think? Eric, you just been doing, you, you're like an expert now, four months. Let's get Aaron's opinion and then Pete's opinion. What? Um, I, I would say the majority of patients that I've been here for have done really well. Right. Even in the recovery room, they say, my leg pain's gone. Right. Um, that's not to say when they come to the office two weeks later, they're still healing. Right. Um, but for the most part, lumbar stenosis patients have improved symptoms right. after surgery. Yeah, they're usually very happy people. Yeah. What do you think, Pete? The initial response is traumatic. The initial response is traumatic. Mm -hmm. They go to a recovery room, they wake up, doctor turns, I can feel my legs. Uh, it's been a long time that I can feel my legs. The next day they wake up, doctor turns, I can't believe this. So, you know, all the pain is gone. I can feel my legs. I can get up and walk. I'm building very slowly. My back hurts, but I'm, I, I've got my legs back. It's usually traumatic. And, and um, because what you've done, the spine would have been compressed, it's being squashed, and it's being the middle, and you decompress them, so that's like, whoa, thank you very much. And, and it's, but at the same time, they got to be careful to they don't complicate life. Right. What complicates life is too much too soon, and then you get scar tissue. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to do that, and I, they know that. I mean, you tell the patients that. Right. If they overdo it, get too much scar tissue, that could really, you know, create a problem. And usually that never happens. It's very rare. You can get recurrent symptoms too from other things. It's like the disease process continues. Right. So it's just like a vascular or a heart disease. You fix the vessels. Well, they keep smoking, whatever, or they just, the, the, the plaque builds up and they get another heart attack. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to do with the fact that the heart surgeon put the wrong vessel in the wrong place. It's just the disease is progressing. Same thing in the spine. The key with the spine though, in contrast to the heart, the key with the spine is you have to now comply with behavior modification. Type 2 diabetic, one brother died, the other one had a stroke. For me, it's no baklava. You know what baklava is? Yes. It's gone. I was raised on it. For them, for these people, if you're not going to be bending, twisting, you don't pick anything up off the floor, off the floor by bending your squat, whatever you do. Mm -hmm. You're not lifting more than 10 or 15, 20 pounds max. Mm -hmm. And when you're coughing and sneezing, you bend your knees. You cough and sneeze and mechanically decompress the spinal cord. When you're sitting, you're never going to sit on the floor the rest of your life and sit on your backside higher than your knees. Mm -hmm. When you're sleeping, you're sleeping in a fetal position to relax the whole spinal cord. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what, I, what we tell them over the years is what patients have told us with aggravate their condition. It's not in the books. They don't teach us this in books. Patients teach us this. And then over a period of time, you, you go through a whole litany of things that they can do to avoid. And, you know, Doc's trying you know, I, Thank you. I mean, I feel really good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna behave. You know, for a diabetic, it's no sweets, two words. Right. For them, it's ten thousand words. Right. But they appreciate it. Yeah. No bad block of all. How about Mila Makarona? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You know what Oki is? It's a major no. Oki to Mila Makarona. All right. I don't say that. So, so uh, any comments about anything about lumbar decompression? Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Next week will be more exciting, I promise. More interesting. <laughs> this one was a little boring. Thank you. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Gory pictures are always exciting, you know. Yeah, surgery is always interesting. <laughs>